Well, Alan, it is good to see you. Good to have you in your chair, your lucky chair, also known as my chair. But how did your trip go? The trip went well. Yep. Uh, uh, Laura and I, we went uh, and we did kind of the western portion of the Gulf Coast campaign. And uh, now we're going to do the eastern portion. But I'm kind of running into a bit of a problem because the high, you know, high price of gas. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, the government, Biden... Uh, shut down the oil and gas leases, some yeah. new ones, and I mean that. That's it's only like four increase. or five dollars to a gallon, yeah. and I can't really afford to go on this trip. You know, I'm telling you, this is a conspiracy to make me not drive out there. Maybe the airlines are doing it. I don't know. The government wants me to buy an electric car. I don't know. But somebody is trying to keep me from going on this trip. Elon Musk is trying to cash in. I think so. Somebody, there's a conspiracy going on. And I really think it's all about you being able to cover this entire Gulf Coast campaign. I, I, it's I sick. So. It is sick. Somebody wants to silence me. You know, I bet you that there'll be a... Um, Speaking you know, of silencing you... Uh, uh, you want me to shut yeah, up? Yeah, go ahead and shut okay. up. Okay. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in, this is the second to last episode of the third season. Uh, it's very exciting uh, because we're going to be taking the rest of the summer off, um, but we will miss you. Um, I'm Dustin Bass. And I'm Alan Joaquin. And this is the Sons of History podcast, of which you will have all summer to catch up on if you uh, missed any of the third season or the second season. Second season, season was really good. Uh, the first season was really long, so that will probably take up your entire summer uh, just sitting there binging. Kind of like the Second Continental Congress. It just kept going on and on and on. You know, You know, it's funny. You've actually used that joke before. Have I? Well, I think you know, we say a lot it, of the same jokes. It was and funny it, then, and it was and funny it's now. funny now. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that was kind of a long one. Yeah. Well, but, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet, uh, shoot us an email at thesonsofhistory at gmail.com saying, hey, I'd love to be part of your newsletter so you can keep up with all that's going on, especially because the podcast is coming to an end in a couple of weeks. Uh, and so that's really going to be one of the primary ways for us to keep in contact. Also, um, you can direct messages on Facebook or Instagram. And while you're doing that, make sure that you like or subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Instagram. I notice this. This is something that I've noticed. This may be a conspiracy too. People who are always like liking our stuff, even leaving comments on our Facebook page, I will go through the likes and then I will send invitations, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who are really interactive with our page who have yet to like the page, but they're interacting. I think you may need to check to see if you've liked the page or maybe um, Zuckerberg and the, their crew is like, oh, you liked it? How about you unlike it now and you have to like it again? So I would go ahead and double check to make sure that you are liking the Facebook page. Um, you know, I have seen yeah. where they, where I will get, do you still want to continue getting, um, you know, like headlines or notices about such and such page? Yeah. I've noticed that. And the uh, no is, is highlighted. But I have to tell it, yes, I still want to get, you know, notifications yeah. From certain pages. It's the weirdest thing. Yeah. Very I, it, weird. And and I don't know why the, the the no is highlighted. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. Maybe they just don't want you to be a part of things. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of being a part of things, this has nothing to do with it. This Week in History. All right. So mine is, you're going to go way back to the medieval period. Uh, we are going to go to okay. uh, May 18 of 11... 52. That's when Henry II marries Eleanor of Aquitaine. Okay, now you're yeah, Henry, whatever, whatever. Well, he wasn't king yet. Um, mm -hmm. Stephen of Blois was the king of England at that time. Hmm. Uh, now, his mother, Matilda, was supposed to be the queen, but that uh, wasn't a big thing having queens. But Stephen of Blois took over. And then there was an agreement, and Henry was to be the king. So so he became Henry II two years later, and he had a bunch of kids. Uh, he had uh, Richard the Lionheart. 
He was the father of John Lackland, you know, mm. Prince John of, of Robin Hood fame. I love it. Uh, Richard the Lionheart fame, you know, the Crusades. So, um, you know, and they had other families, uh, other kids, uh, Jeffrey, and then there was a William, and there was Henry the Younger, who was supposed to be the king also. So a uh, very prominent family, um, you know, Eleanor. Eleanor was married to a Louis the Seventh, I believe, or one of the Louis of France. Uh, you got Louis the Seventh on was there. Was it Louis the yep. Seventh? All right. So she was Nailed the former, former wife of Francis Louis the Seventh, and then uh, marriage was annulled. And she married Henry and became, you know. So there was, uh, now who was Henry II? Henry II, obviously we told you who he was the father of. Um, he did um, he did have daughters, a Matilda, Eleanor, and Joan, which you really don't hear much about them. Jeffrey, you do if you watch the movie Lion in Winter. The point of This Week in History for you is it, what? The that they wedding. Got married? They got married okay. on May 18th. You lost me through well, the genealogy. Not, well, I'm just, I want people to know who, they must who know. Henry Henry is. Henry was the first. Oh, the, Henry. Henry was the first Plantagenet. I'm going to touch you again. I'm going to keep. He was the first Plantagenet. Plantagenet king, something like that, which which went all the way until uh, was it uh, Richard the Third? Yeah, Richard the Third, the Yorkist, when he was uh, killed in battle at the uh, Battle of Bosworth or Battle of Bosworth Field in yeah. fourteen eighty five, when he lost to Henry Tudor, who became Henry the Seventh. You know, the Battle of Bosworth always reminds me of the battle, the NFL battle between Bo Jackson and Brian Bosworth, and Bo Jackson destroyed Bosworth. Okay. Yeah, okay. All, All right, right. You know, so... Oh, my, hey, hey, I'm not done yet. I wish I'm you were. Um, I did want to mention that Henry II was also the guy whose words, complaints about uh, Thomas Beckett, the Archbishop mm. of Canterbury, ended up leading to his murder at the uh, in the cathedral, yeah. or in the church, or in the Poor sanctuary. Beckett. So, uh, but yeah, so if you want to watch, and, and I'm going to bring this up, uh, The Lion in Winter shows a pretty good uh, presentation of Henry II's tenure. Interesting. Yeah, at least. Did you ever watch the movie Beckett? Uh, doesn't that Peter O'Toole also play Thomas so. Beckett? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, Peter O'Toole plays... Did you uh, see it? I have not seen I have, it. No, I have okay. not. I've seen... I've I was seen wondering the, if it was any good. I've seen The Lion in Winter, but I have Boy, not seen... Boy, my uh, stomach is rumbling. Can you hear that? Um, I thought that was the dog. Well, it's the dog too. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's like dead. dreaming. Uh, she's probably dreaming of you ending your this week in history. Are you well, done yet? I'm done. Thank yes. you. But yeah, oh, oh, no. Plantagenets, they're the ones that ended up becoming Lancasters and the Yorks. But that was later on when they had the Wars of the Roses. Okay, very interesting. All right, did you watch the Kentucky Derby? This past week? No, I was. Did you actually, see the highlights at least? I, I didn't see. I don't know who won. Oh I, my god! I was actually. I heard that there was someone losing, and he somehow won at the yeah, last. Yeah, he second. was the the long shot, eighty yes. to one. Yes. Um. But no, I was actually at uh, the North Shore of Punch Lake Pontchartrain, and you know what's funny was because everyone was like, "Hey, you're gonna watch the Kentucky Derby?" I'm like, "Eh," you know. Yeah. Right. I, I, I you know, I I missed the Triple Crown winner. Mm -hmm. Okay, I I watched the the uh, the Kentucky that was a couple of years ago. I think yeah. in 15, 2015. Mm -hmm. somewhere in there. I watched the Kentucky Derby and then I watched the Preakness, and you know, and I missed the, the Belmont the Belmont Stakes. I Dang. was so pissed when I found out that it was the first first time in what like 30, 40 it was years. A, yeah, a since, very long time since the seventies. Yeah, yeah, so. I was pissed. Well, that stinks. Um, well, I didn't watch the Kentucky Derby either. I, I don't really go all in on horse racing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did watch, obviously, the replay like a number of times. It's insane. If you haven't watched that, you got to you gotta check that out. It's absolutely insane. Uh, but May 17th of 1875 is when the very first Kentucky Derby takes place at Churchill Downs in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, there were 15 thoroughbreds. You hear that? You hear mm -hmm. that stomach? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. crazy. 15 thoroughbreds. Um, they raced the one and a half miles. Aristides or Aris, Aristides. Aris, yeah. How would you say it? I would say Aristides, but Aristides. then I also called uh, Catalan. I called them Catalan. 
Yeah, Catalin. Yeah. Yeah. Or Cataline. Yeah. It's a Cataline. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I know. It's tough. It's I tough. don't know the phonetics. You know, I read. You got to have a professor next to you at all times. Well, yeah, okay. Like the Solace uh, mm-hmm. wrote the. Is it the Uger theme? You know what's Uger weird theme? is that you're talking about the future. I all know. right. Aristides I, I <laughs> was the winner of the first Kentucky Derby. Um, he was named after the ancient Greek general and statesman, Aristides the Just. Now, the writer was Oliver Lewis. He never rode in the Kentucky Derby again. He eventually retired to be, well, retired from. You mean the uh, jockey? Yeah, the jockey. What okay, did I say? The, it sounded like he said the writer. Oh, the writer. The, the jockey. Yeah, the jockey. Yeah. Uh, I apologize. Uh, the jockey retired to become a trainer and a bookmaker. Now, the horse won $2,850, which would be about $75,000 today. Uh, of course, um, uh, what's his face? Rich Strike, the one who won this Kentucky Derby, won I think like one point three million, somewhere in there, mm-hmm. well over a million dollars. Now, I say two thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. Aristides won, which would be seventy five thousand dollars now. But the spending power, come on, let's think about it. Since eighteen eighty, the dollar has lost has lost ninety six percent of its value. Thanks, Fed. All right. You know, you said 1875. Mm -hmm. That was still during Reconstruction. Yeah. It hadn't even ended yet, so I'm surprised that they, you know, anything productive went on in the South during that time. Although Kentucky was neutral. Yeah, Kentucky was a neutral state. Kentucky was a neutral state, so. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, that is This Week in History. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we've got a very special guest. Uh, He is here to talk about... Cataline? Cataline or Cataline? I'm going to say Cataline. we'll see. He's the professor. I'm not. He knows the phonetics. I don't. Yeah, I hope he shoots you down. Yeah, All right, ladies and gentlemen, Josiah Osgood. Uh, he is the professor of classics at Georgetown University. He is going to be joining us. He has published several books, including Caesar's Legacy, Civil War and the Emergence of the Roman Empire, Turia, or would you say Turia? How do you spell it? Mm, T-U-R-I-A. I'd say Turia. Okay, Turia, let's go with that. A Roman woman's civil war, Rome and the making of a world slate, and the most recent work, How to Stop a Conspiracy, an Ancient Guide to Saving a Republic by Sallust. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I really think that you're going to very much enjoy this conversation with Josiah Osgood. Josiah, it's great to have you. How are you doing? Uh, Doing great. So glad to be with you guys this afternoon. Thanks. Hey, we're, we're excited to have this conversation. Um, I know Alan and I are both fans of the subject of the Roman Republic. Uh, but my first question is, uh, how often do you get to do these types of interviews on the Woodland or on the Washington Mall? I'm in the Woodlands on the Washington Mall. How, how is that even possible? <laughs> oh, this is just a photo. I've, I've uh, pulled one on you guys here. I'm actually just in my study at home, but uh, the background's not very interesting. So this is a, uh, a photo of, of the mall in Washington, as, as you saw. Yeah, because I was like, man, there is no wind. There is zero wind yeah. out in Washington, D.C. right now. Yeah, yeah. I remember that's where uh, Forrest Gump ran into, uh, you know, Jenny right, right there. Right there, <laughs> jumped in the water. Yeah, well, that's the good thing with Zoom, right, is we can all become uh, Forrest Gump these days. There you go. <laughs> good man to replicate. All right, well, we are here to talk about your book and the subject. Let's start off with uh, Cataline and who was he? And uh, obviously, if you're going to talk about him, we also need to know who Sulla was. Yeah, so Cataline was a Roman senator. Uh, meaning he was elected to political offices living in the the last century BC, uh, which is also the period when the Roman Republic was in great turmoil. And I think really the most important thing to know about him is that he was a patrician. And that had a very specific meaning in ancient Roman, meant that you could trace your ancestry back to the earliest days of the city. You know, when the Romans thought that there were kings and gods walking around and, and all the rest of it. So um, he, he had this very prestigious background, um, but the family had 
really fallen onto hard times and for, for centuries wasn't going anywhere politically. And I think that's really important for understanding who this guy Catiline was. He, um, he, he had a chip on his shoulder. You know, he really wanted to restore the glory of his family, the, this great patrician name, and uh, would do just about anything to do that. And uh, that sort of ties into the other name you mentioned, right, uh, Sulla. Sulla, actually quite interesting. Um, he had a very similar story. He was also from one of these patrician families, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, that likewise had, had sort of um, been out of the limelight for a long time. And he was about a generation older than, than Catiline and sort of rose to power and, and ultimately became dictator of Rome at the end of a very nasty civil war and killed a lot of enemies, confiscated property and young Catiline, you know, who's sort of in his, in his twenties or so at this time, uh, actually kind of sided with Sulla, killed a few people during the civil war and definitely started to build up a portfolio of property for himself. So he sort of, uh, saw Sulla almost in a way as kind of a, a role model for what he was going to try to do to restore his name, restore his family's name. Now, what makes your translation different from others? Or uh, are you trying to, you know, bring up a different way to look at it? I mean, what's what was the uh, tell us about uh, your translation versus the others? Yeah, so, um, so the book I've translated is is sort of an ancient bestseller. Uh, it was written about the conspiracy that Catiline later in life uh, launched to overtake the Roman Republic and in some ways kind of to pull a Sulla. Okay. And so the author of it is a guy named Sallust, who was uh, writing about a generation or so after the conspiracy. And he'd been in politics, became very sort of disenchanted with things and kind of took a page um, out of the great Greek historian Thucydides, who went off into exile and then wrote the definitive history of the great Peloponnesian War, which really is sort of about the fall of Athens. And Sallust is kind of interested in the fall of Rome. So my translation, so this book is, is uh, pretty well known, the conspiracy of of Catiline, and there are definitely some, some great translations out there already. Um, what sets mine apart is I've tried a bit harder to make it um, fully accessible to a 21st century audience. Sallust wrote almost kind of deliberately in an old fashioned style, because he wanted to sound, you know, like the, the great Romans of centuries earlier, you know, who built up the Republic and fought Hannibal and and all the rest of it. So he he sounds um, deliberately old fashioned. And of course, you could try to do that in English. But I made the decision just to, to try to make him as accessible as possible and to include sort of little um, headlines throughout the, the book to sort of help guide readers along. So so it's just meant to make this very gripping story he tells even even easier to to read and use for a, a modern audience. So you've got Catiline, when, when you look at his life and you, you're saying that he's trying to restore his, not just his name, but his family's name. Um, he goes through some, some turmoil where he's accused of adultery with the Vestal Virgin, um, corruption in North Africa. Cicero starts claiming, hey, this guy is about to uh, conduct a, a conspiracy, an assassination attempt on some of the senators. So, one, explain the relationship between Cicero and Catiline, and was all of that had taken place along with um, Catiline's attempt to become consul that didn't work out. I think he tried twice or three times. Um, all of that did, how did that sort of move him towards the eventual conspiracy or coup, attempted coup? Yeah, great, great question. Uh... The, the rap sheet is a mile long and, and you got a lot of the highlights there. So um, yeah, so Catiline, um, he, he did have a, 
a sort of unsavory reputation. And, and a lot of these uh, crimes of his, right, or, or alleged crimes of his were sort of first really brought out into the open by Cicero. So, so let's talk about Cicero for a moment, who's really the other great figure in the story of the conspiracy. And the, the conspiracy was in 63 BC, um, when Catiline was running probably for the second time for a consul. So he'd already lost once. He had run the year before, you know, and thought, finally, I'm going to, I'm going to make it here. I'm going to pay off all my debts and, and, you know, restore the honor that, that my family and I are owed. So what happened was he was actually running against Cicero in 64. And the thing to know about Cicero is he's the exact opposite of Catiline. He was a so-called new man. He came from a little town outside Rome, a very bright kid. His father you know, spotted the talent early on and sent him to Rome to be educated by all of these leading senators, the best lawyers of the day. So, so Cicero in his 20s started to acquire the reputation as the best attorney in Rome. He could get anyone um, exonerated for any crime it seemed practically. So he very ambitious and uh, he ran against Catiline in 64 and much to Catiline's humiliation, right? Cicero actually beat him out. Now there were two consuls elected each year in Rome, this is the top office. So an, another spot um, went to a guy named Antonius, but basically there was sort of bad blood already during the campaign because Cicero smeared Catiline. That's where some of these stories start. And then, and then Catiline loses to Cicero. So, you know, after this point, they, they really, um, especially Catiline, you know, I think sort of has it out for Cicero because it, it adds to his humiliation, right? He's lost and he's lost to a new man despite his own, you know, grand patrician ancestry. So it rankles with him. Yeah. Um, didn't uh, Cicero at one time, because you're talking about his, his education, not to get off track, but didn't he at one time uh, exile or just leave uh, Rome to go study uh, with the Greeks? Is that correct? Yeah, well, you, you can never get off track um, by talking about Cicero if you're Cicero. So he, he'd be grateful for the question. Yeah, so th that's right. So Cicero, um, uh, in at the age of 26, uh, he had his first big criminal case. Um, and the courts had been shut for a while because of the civil war that we talked about. They reopened. It was a murder trial, very sensational, you know, and a big question after all the, the violence of the time, you know, can we restore criminal justice system? So Cicero pretty bravely sort of stuck his neck out and, um, and defended uh, a man who, who actually was accused of killing his own father, you know, the most heinous crime for the Romans and, you know, practically enough to get you convicted just, just to mention such a thing. So, yeah, so Cicero um, had this great triumph, um, but we're told, you know, he was kind of skinny still at the time. He had a little bit of trouble with his voice. Um, so, at least according to his own story, he then went off to Greece for a couple of years to do a study tour. His ancient biographer Plutarch says actually he was also a little bit nervous about the politics of what he'd just done. And that was why he, he left Rome. But one way or another, he went off. He studied with a Greek uh, teacher who was very good and, uh, and sort of built up his body. You know, training to be a public speaker, it's sort of half, half like training to be an opera singer nowadays and half like lifting weights in the gym or something. You know, you have to really develop your, your strength there. So Cicero did and went back. And, you know, this is then really when that legal career of his just skyrocketed and, um, and, and brought him his, the success he would eventually enjoy in politics. It's all about working out the core, man. Yeah, you know this. Um, I was gonna. I was gonna say the the whole story kind of. Well, maybe you can tell me which one do you prefer? That this is like the An Andrew Jackson versus the Adams family, or Bill Clinton versus the Bush family. 
Which one do you think it yeah. does? Yeah, people people have often made the comparison with um, with Cicero and John Adams in particular. Um, it, you know, John Adams actually, we have a letter I, I quoted in the book writing to John Quincy Adams saying, "Read your Sallust." You know, it, it, um, so they definitely would have been on the the Cicero side of things here. Um, so, yeah, so I'm on Cicero's side here, pretty pretty firmly, um, which is which is controversial. You know, Catiline has had his his champions over the years. Um, there are definitely some things we can sort of criticize Cicero for, right? And, and I'll just mention one and it sort of gets to your question, right? So, so what happened is Catiline lost that first election and then he decided to run, run again. And um, Rome was going through a, a credit crisis at the time uh, for sort of complicated reasons having to do with foreign policy and, and uh, capitalists sort of wanting to invest again in the Roman East because conditions were improving there. So all the loans were being called in, in Italy and it led to a, a credit crunch and a lot of people were facing hardship, even ruin, probably including Catiline. So he, even though he's this patrician, right, um, sort of suddenly becomes the great populist and says, I'm running on a, a platform of debt cancellation. And there was no prospect more awful to Cicero and his friends than the idea of just writing off people's debts. Um, so, so that's part of why he and Cicero are also clashing with each other, right, is, is this, this controversy. So, so where I would criticize Cicero, right, is he, Cicero really just had very little ability, in my opinion, to sort of understand the problems of ordinary Romans and, and sort of think about solutions um, that would, would provide them sort of basic stability and dignity in their lives. Um, but the problem is Catiline is just such a flawed sort of champion of, of the common man. So that's why I don't really side with him either, if that makes sense. I mean, his stance just seems totally opportunist to me and almost really sort of demagogic, you know, not, uh, not born out of long and, and deep sympathy for, for ordinary Romans. So that's kind of where I come down on that. So I guess your, your comparison is Andrew Jackson would be well, Catiline and well, when John Quincy said Adams new, would be Cicero? Well, the, you have the nope. new man. Am I right? No, uh, no, is it no, okay, no, I'm not even here, well, you, am I? Okay, I am going to overthrow you and when this show is this over. This is a coup, it's yes. a coup, get your hands off me. <laughs> No, no, I'm talking about, okay, so I, I kept hearing the term uh, nuovo homo, and yeah. that, uh, okay, so Cicero's the new man, mm -hmm. he's running against the family, uh, an established family, so I was looking at Andrew Jackson as he was, he didn't come from a prestigious family, right. uh, ran against the Adams mm -hmm. family, and then, and, and Adams, uh, John Quincy Adams defeated um, Jackson, Jackson uh, was it in 24? 1824. So then, um, then you had the Bushes. You had the Bush family, uh, George Bush. You had uh, Preston Bush, who mm -hmm. was a senator. And then here comes Bill Clinton, who also doesn't come from a prestigious family. And uh, he defeats the Bushes. Yep. And then the new man. Yeah. So I looked at, you know, you look at Bill Clinton. I was looking at Bill Clinton as a new man, Andrew Jackson as a new man, picking yep. on the established families. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, to to get even slightly more modern, um, uh, although here the, I mean, your comparisons are really neat, but um, you know, I think if you you want to hear a little bit of of new man rhetoric, you know, the Trump campaign of twenty sixteen, sort of running against the establishment, right, the the crooked establishment, the deep state, you know, some of that actually did sound. Um, kind of kind of Roman to me. And of course, I guess the the funny thing is the Clintons went, as you say, from being sort of the the outsiders um to being sort of portrayed as as the corrupt establishment by by 2016. So yeah, these themes sort of definitely weave through weave through republics, you know, the Roman Republic and and our Republic as well. 
So I, I got a question um, for for you on as far as you said, you know, I come down on, you know, with, with Cicero on this. And I think you said that you've there have been some champions of Catiline in the past. So Catiline has these accusations. It sort of goes back to one of my first questions, but he has these accusations and some of them come to nothing. Um, and then he eventually attempts the coup. Um, was it one of those things where he was, tr people were trying to give him a worse rap than what he really deserved. And he eventually was just like, screw it. You've, you've just cheated me out of two consoles. Now I'm going to take it. And not that that's justifiable, but is it, is that why some people maybe champion him in the past? Yeah, you got it. Um, it, so champions, apologists, you know, there's sort of a range of views, but, um, but that's, that's kind of exactly right. And that's what a harsher critic of, of Cicero would say, you know, is that Cicero sort of almost drove Catiline in, into the corner and he, you know, he had no, no other option, but, but basically what happened, and this is why I think, you know, apologizing goes too far in my opinion is, um, so he lost the second attempt at the election and he'd been in touch with a, a sort of militia that was kind of forming in Northern Italy. It included um, former veterans, um, people who were, were struggling with this debt problem that we mentioned. And, and what Catiline did was um, after he lost, he basically decided that he would use this militia, you know, uh, members of which, you know, some of these guys had very legitimate problems and grievances, but he, Catalan decided that he would sort of use that to, as you say, to stage the coup, right? And uh, so he, a little bit after the, the failed election, he uh, holds a meeting. This is described by Sallust, described by, by Cicero too. He holds a meeting and a couple of this guy's volunteer to go to Cicero's house at the, the meetings politicians host every morning. They're going to kill Cicero. But actually, Cicero had a mole. He had a, a source of intelligence. He probably had quite a few, but one in particular. Um, she was the, the mistress of one of Catiline's uh, associates in the conspiracy. So she got word to Cicero and he, he, uh, he survived the threat. So Catiline immediately after this, Cicero denounces him in the Senate and talks about this. Catiline fled that, that night and went to join the militia, the, the army in Northern Italy. And, and he actually starts carrying around the, the lictor, uh, the, sorry, the fasces, um, which is the bundle of rods that symbolize the power of the Roman consul. You know, we see these on like they're on the dime, they're, they're all over um, uh, American political imagery too. In the, in the US, they were sort of appropriated as a symbol of union. But for the, the Romans, um, they represent the power of the consul. So basically Catiline acts as if he's been elected to office when he wasn't, you know, and, and then it's gonna march with this, this uh, army probably about 10,000 people, so not insignificant um, on, on Rome. And the Senate has to summon a few legions of its own and they get you know, into a small civil war that's, uh, that's fought in Northern Italy, um, just outside the city of Florence nowadays. So you know, this was pretty serious and, um, and lives were lost you know, as, a, as a result of, of Catiline's doing. So, it, that's why I think, you know, you're absolutely right that you can sort of say he got backed into the situation, a, a hopeless situation by, by Cicero, but, but, you know, it doesn't speak well to his honor, what he, how he ended up responding to that. Right. Yeah. Um, there's people often make mention about the fact that when he is killed in that battle, um, he's not killed from behind. In other words, he, and he was on the front lines of that battle killed from the front for some reason. Um, people sort of 
herald that as honorable. Um, and, and it is obviously because you're not starting a coup and then you're running off and then you're getting killed on your, on your way out. Um, is, does, what does that, what does that mean other than the fact that he was there fighting? Yeah. So, it, you know, actually that, that sort of particular version really does come from, from Sallust, the, the account that I've written a new translation of. And I, one of the reasons I really recommend um, reading Sallust is, is, you know, so we said he sort of likes to sound like a good old fashioned Roman and, you know, back in the good old days when, when Romans, you know, were kicking ass in Carthage instead of, you know, killing each other in civil war. So he has all of that, but he, he ends up sort of occasionally making Catiline sound kind of heroic. He gives Catiline a couple of speeches to give. They're very stirring that sort of talk about the, um, how little the ruling class cares about, uh, about ordinary Romans and you're sort of cheering him on, right? And then as you say, um, at the end, you know, he, he has kind of this, this death scene, right? Where he's found, his body is found you know, right in the middle of, of, of where the Roman casualties were. So he was fighting at the front. And, and Salas says, you know, his, as his body was found, he was still breathing just a little bit. And his face wore the defiant expression that he always had in life. You know, so he's, he's kind of a, a, a bad guy, but a bad guy who, who the audience is sort of cheering for a little bit more. You know, he has this allure to him. Uh, he's a gangster, but uh, kind of a glamorous gangster and uh, courageous and, and whatnot. Is, uh, is Solace the only source for this story? Uh, I think he's, so he, he's the main source along with Cicero himself. And, and one thing that sort of speaks for, for Cicero is, is Solace was writing a generation later, probably after Cicero died. And he really could have told the story in any number of ways. And, and the fact that he ultimately kind of defends Cicero, Cicero's conduct, I, I, think, I think speaks well of Cicero. But yeah, he, he is the one who gives us that great, that sort of great death scene and does raise these questions, right? About, I mean, I think some of it was solace just he's sort of confronting us with the, the, the problem as he saw it in the Roman Republic that with, with a political class mostly absorbed in its own interests, right? People would would look to a very dubious champion, um, who you know who had charisma, but a terrible character. Uh, as Salas sees it, so yeah, he he's kind of the main source. There's some later accounts that that um, add bits and pieces. So. Roman Republic, it is against the law to kill a Roman citizen without a trial. Um, and this is where, from my perspective, Cicero goes a little wrong. Um, and Cicero tells, he's consul and he's telling everybody, hey, this is what's going on with Catiline. Uh, the conspirators have been caught. The conspirators were some senators. We need to kill these senators immediately and without trial. Um, how much did Cicero's push for the immediate punishment death of those senators hurt the Roman constitution and Cicero's, um, ability in the future to argue for the rule of law and the constitution? Yeah. Great, great question. And this, this is one of the, the sort of key takeaways for us to think about from this from this episode is, is it really gets to sort of the problem of, of what we would nowadays call domestic terrorism, right? Um, you know, you have a, an attempted coup and there are these senators and others back in Rome. So Catiline went off with the army, but their job is to um, carry out arson, few assassinations, sort of prepare the way for Catiline to come back. And Cicero, um, kind of carries out this sting, which Salas tells us all about. Cicero never revealed the details. So Salas, Salas gives us the behind the scenes. Cicero carried out this kind of sting to get letters that incriminated those, 
those um, conspirators in Rome. And then he presents all of this to the Senate. And as you say, the Senate then voted, right, to, um, to execute, to tell Cicero to carry out the execution. And, and that's what he wanted. He made that clear. What's kind of interesting is that actually, much to Cicero's own dismay, the, the decisive speech was given by an up and coming politician, Cato the Younger who was just in his early 30s, sort of an unknown in politics. And he made his reputation with that speech. And it sort of was the start of his rivalry with, with Julius Caesar, who took the other side and said, uh, guys, you know, it's not good for the Senate to instantly execute Roman citizens. Caesar probably said, lock them up and was thinking there could be a trial later, okay? But what Cato argued, and Salas gives us a version of the speech, is um, if we don't act now, the, the, that army is going to grow and grow and grow. And we'll be sending many more Roman boys you know, there to fight this army. And we'll have chaos in the city. So, so after the executions, you know, there's this idea of expediency. After the executions, a lot of the army melted away. So that's the justification, right? I'm just trying to present that side of things. That's that's one of the justifications is, you know, actually this is going to spare spare us um, a lot of trouble, prevent a full on civil war, and and that kind of worked out to be the case. But you get at the at the question, right? Is is can a republic do something like that and not risk? the precedent being abused for far worse reasons later. And that's really the point that Julius Caesar made in his speech, right? Which Sallust also gives a version of is, is, you know, it may look like the right thing to do now, but if we start trampling on our civil liberties, watch out what's going to happen. And, and readers of the book would sort of note a real irony there because probably at the time Sallust was writing, there were actually death squads going around, killing people falsely accused of assassinating Julius Caesar himself, right? So, so there was kind of um, uh, an actual kind of abuse of the precedent, just as Caesar warned, right? That, that we can have these kangaroo courts with instantaneous justice. Um, that's not justice at all. So yeah, so I, th I think there is definitely a, a, a kind of cautionary there. Well, you mentioned Caesar. So, okay, so Julius Caesar was there. Um, Crassus and uh, Pompey. So he, they formed the uh, first triumvirate. Were they all there watching? How did it affect them when they created the first triumvirate? Um, yeah, it's a great question. And that is part of why this conspiracy um, you know, was so so juicy for so long afterwards. As you have you have Cicero, who thought it was his finest hour, even though as we've said, there are some reasons to doubt that. But then you have Julius Caesar, you have Cato, you have their whole future rivalry, which would lead to civil war, kind of created at this moment. But then you have others. So so Crassus had been Crassus is the very wealthy senator. Um, He'd been kind of a backer of Catiline early on. And, but then he, in the year 63, gets the sense Catiline's just too hot to handle and dumps him. And there's actually this kind of great moment, very juicy moment, when um, uh, after the election, um, Catiline gets all these, uh, Crassus gets all these dit letters um, at his house, delivered after dinner, warning of the danger of, of Catalan. So he takes them all to Cicero. And some people have speculated that Crassus actually forged these letters um, so that he would be able to prove very dramatically that he had cut ties with his old friend Catalan. So that's kind of a fun detail. But yeah, so, so Crassus is there. He stayed away from the Senate at the actual critical meeting voting on those executions, um, afraid, I think, to take a stance 
and that's very typical of Crassus. He's he's um, a sort of very shady character, right? He he amassed this huge real estate empire through sort of underhanded means, and and he's always lurking in the background, but you can never quite figure out what he's doing. And then you have Pompey, right? Who who's the greatest Roman at this point, the most powerful, but he's still off in the east, finishing up the wars there that he'd been fighting, and and sort of one of the questions, right, that that emerges towards the end of all this is. Some of Pompey's friends want to call him back, actually, to be the general who would finish off, finish off Catiline. But actually, Catiline's army was defeated in time, so that never really ended up happening. But uh, yeah, he he's sort of there, and the people are sort of wondering, what are we going to do with Pompey? Because this is the big question really of of the moment in Roman politics. How do we bring this general back and kind of integrate him into politics? So your book is called How to Stop a Conspiracy. And how to stop a conspiracy, right? So you have, and I'm going to go a little past uh, the Catiline conspiracy. So you have it to where Cicero is like, hey, we've got to stop this now. Um, and that happens. Julius Caesar says, hey, we can't sacrifice the Constitution for, as you said, expediency, right, to deal with this situation because we don't want an all-out civil war. First triumvirate includes Pompey, right? Eventually, you have a civil war between Julius Caesar and Pompey, um, and then you have Caesar cross the Rubicon declares himself dictator, is assassinated a few years later, and what happens? You end up having the empire, uh, the Caesars, start from there. It's like you stopped the conspiracy, but <laughs> another conspiracy, like a couple of conspiracies took place. The one thing that you didn't want to have happen was an all-out civil war still took place, and then you lose the republic, more or less. How to stop a conspiracy. Is there a way to stop a conspiracy? Do you have it play out? Or what are you wanting readers to really consider after reading your book? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, so Sallust was in, you know, writing a, a counterinsurgency manual. You know, you're not going to get the detailed plan for, for how to handle it. But I, but I think he suggests a couple of things, right? So, so yeah, Cicero... Cicero and the Senate solution was by no means perfect and, and dangerous. But, um, but one thing, for example, that Cicero did right was he sort of cultivated his sources of intelligence. He very patiently built up evidence, didn't reveal things until he had an overwhelming amount of proof, and then was able to, to show the Senate that there was a real threat, right? And that they had to act at various points in time. So I, I think that's sort of um, kind of a, in a narrow sense, kind of a takeaway, right, is, is, um, is how you, um, you, you know, if you're going, I mean, we live in an age of conspiracy theories, right? And, and, and yet sometimes there are real conspiracies at the same time. But if you have all the, the sort of rumors and wild allegations flying around, nobody's going to believe anything, even when there is a real threat. Right, so that that's kind of one of the points I'm making in the book, and and to you know one thing you can do is sort of patiently build the case, right? You know, as as was done, for example, um, in in Watergate, to to use a modern example, um, as um, Congress investigated. So okay, so that's kind of one answer to your question, but the bigger question, right, is you know. The Romans, and I think Sallust is getting at this, is, is you've got to sort of solve the bigger problems of democracy or these conspiracies are going to keep happening, right? And, and I think that's where Sallust is leaving us with some questions. Is, is Cicero made some smart moves, but did he leave ordinary Romans, you know, with enough of a hope of kind of peaceful self-government that would respond to the, the needs and desires and, and problems of individual Romans and offer them something so that you wouldn't have armies rising and 
people like Catalan becoming popular heroes, right? And and I think that's kind of sort of the question, a question we face nowadays, right? And and it goes back to, as you said, Andrew Jackson, it's a question through all of all of American history, right? Is sort of how do you create the vision to the US Civil War as well, of course, right? You know, how do you how do you create a vision um, of a society where you defend, you defend, you know, peaceful um, self-government. And, and I think the Romans there, you know, the, the big lesson, the warning is that they ultimately, even Cicero, the great patriot, failed to do that. And that's kind of the, the challenge, the challenge we face. I'm not saying that's going to, you know, get rid of every last threat one faces. It probably won't. But I think it's something our politicians could, you know, on, on all sides could work a little harder on. You know, there's so much of a rhetoric of sort of our side's got to win this one or do this for me or do this for the party. And, um, you know, that becomes very poisonous after a while if you're not um, not creating a rhetoric of, of, a, of a shared national self-government. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I guess it's just uh, play the cards that are dealt you and then uh, see what happens. I don't know if you can even, I don't know, sometimes I always thought you can't really fight a conspiracy. You can only expose it and hope that yeah. that the players change things around, but they're going to happen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think if, I th I think Cicero, um, as you said, I think he made the right choice as far as being patient, getting all the information, presenting it to the Senate. And you tie in the Watergate scandal, sort of the same thing going on. The difference was there was going to be a trial for Nixon, except he resigned, right? So that was, I think, the big missing point is you had a, for expediency, the short term was, okay, you killed these senators and you lost a lot of people that was in that 10,000 plus militia, right? You, a lot of them were like, okay, we're not gonna deal with this. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the, the short term never outweighs the long term. And I think the long term would always be uh, do what Cicero did, except also make sure the Constitution is always sort of that preeminent factor um, that you say, OK, we're not going to go against the Constitution in order to have peace uh, in the short term. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's I think it's you know, pretty clear that 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 is is one of the takeaways, right? And, you know, of course, to, I mean, the the writers of the US Constitution, you know, they studied their classics, we've talked about John Adams and, and Sallust and, and, you know, of course, with with Nixon, right, there's a link, because there's an impeachment procedure, which allows you to, um, after due process to to get rid of, of somebody um, in the government who's posing a threat to it. So, you know, I'm, I, I don't think we can all just sit easy, right? Um, these, these are always dangerous and difficult situations when you have, you know, people within a country plotting against it. But um, yeah, but definitely the, the rule of law is, is much stronger in, in the modern system, um, going back to the constitution. And I think that's a lesson learned, learned from the Romans. And, and some of their failings. You got anything else, man? No, I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's an interesting topic. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, when you sit and think about it, I think politics is just going to breed conspiracies. Politics mm -hmm. is going to create intrigue, you know. Um, you could have, I, 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 I've always respected the, the founding fathers, but even they, you know, um, Hamilton and Jefferson worked against Adams. Madison, I mean, they all worked against each other. Mm -hmm. I think the only one they didn't work against was Washington. But yeah. you can, I think politics turns good men into people who conduct intrigue and which leads to conspiracy. Yeah. So I, that's just in the system. And, and, you know, you can't just, you know, wipe out a system and create a new one and expect... You know, different yeah, results. Yeah, to be like clean. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. still going to be. Yeah, it's still going to be politics. Yeah, yeah. So, I think you guys are right. And just one other point I'd make very quickly, right, is I think um, 
in, in republics in particular, sort of there's a, a real tendency to charge the other side with conspiracy. And I think that's a, a parallel between Rome and, and the US. We see it nowadays. You know, one side is always accusing the other of, of plotting to overthrow the government in bed with, you know, foreign powers, on and on it goes. And but that goes back to, as you say, to the days of John Adams and and Jefferson. So it's it's sort of, I think, something we can all at least be be on watch for is sort of the tendency to to hysterically turn what what you guys are talking about which is normal politics um into into sort of a bigger threat than sometimes it needs to be right and and we can real conspiracies but then there's ordinary politics and we shouldn't confuse the two so i i think that's something we can you know at least try to take away from all of this as well yeah, that's a good point yeah Absolutely. Hey, um, Josiah, this has been a fantastic conversation. Really enjoyed it. I do have one not off topic um, question, but sort of because this whole uh, the Catalan conspiracy, it sort of plays out almost like a Shakespearean tragedy. Um, there is a movie it was with Christian Bell. I don't know if you ever watched it. It's called Hostiles. Um, anyways, it's like right after the Civil War. Anyways, at the end of the movie, you tell me what he's what he's talking about. It ties in Julius Caesar and Shakespeare. He gives uh, the little boy his copy of Julius Caesar, the, the, the book of Shakespeare. And he said, here, read this. It's about the greatest man who ever lived. Now, is he talking about and you can chime in, too, if you want. Is he talking about Julius Caesar or do you think he's talking about Brutus? Yeah, so I haven't seen the movie, but, um, you know, if it's, I, I, it, I mean, that's a great line because it doesn't, it sort of perfectly capture the ambiguity of, of Shakespeare's play, right? Julius Caesar is the Colossus and, and then he's killed by, you know, the noblest Roman of them all, Brutus, right? So you're sort of act three cheering for Brutus. You think Brutus has this figured out. But then, you know, Caesar's ghost makes his reappearance and, and Brutus goes down at the end, right? So, so Shakespeare gives us, I mean, it is a bit like um, Sallust, only even deeper, but he gives us that, that same um, problem, you know, that the, the bad guy, Caesar, is sort of the powerful one and, and the charismatic one and his name, you know, becomes so powerful that even after his death, Right, it still, it still carries more weight and defeats Brutus. So I don't, I don't know the answer to your question, but I'm going to say it's it's delightfully ambiguous, reflecting the, the play and the history. Well, if if, uh, if asked that question, I would say my opinion, and tell me if you agree or disagree, that uh, Cincinnati was the greatest Roman that ever lived. Well, Cincinnati wasn't even in the play. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, I didn't read the play. I didn't read the, uh, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> Christian Bale. Okay. What American psycho. And he played John Connor. Oh, man. oh and Christian, Christian Bale in his prime would be a great, um, actor for Catalan for sure. You know, but I think, yeah, Cincinnati is the one we should all be, we should all be writing about and, and is a better role model for all of us. But, um, you know, no Hollywood actor is going to want to play Cincinnati. They're all going to want to play Catalan. He's more interesting. But yeah, yeah, Cincinnati is 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 the is the ideal, right? The, the Roman who steps forward and sort of helps the country, but then can can go off back to the farm afterwards and and um, you know not not continue to feud and plot and do all these other nasty things that we've been talking about. Yeah, thank God our founding fathers, in particular George Washington, uh, utilized the Cincinnati example yeah. instead of the Catiline or even the Cicero example. So, yeah, good stuff. It's a great point. Yeah, yeah, Cincinnati, even though we know very little about him, actually, you know, was more their hero than Cicero. Nice point. Absolutely. My hero. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. And yeah. you're a farmer too. Hey, Hey, uh, Josiah, this has been uh, a lot of fun. Thanks again for, for joining the podcast. Really appreciate it. 
Hey, thanks so much for having me. I knew it. I knew he was going to correct me. Cattle, well, he didn't even, he did it in a way that it didn't even seem like a correction. He mm -hmm. just said, Catiline in the sentence. He it's, didn't say, hey, guy. I know, I know, I know that. He did not, he he didn't, I mean, he didn't embarrass me. But I, what I'm saying is I oh, knew, you I took knew care I was going to get it yourself. wrong. I knew I was going to get it wrong. Uh -huh. But see this, you see, you know, I read these books. I don't have anyone there to sit and say, you know, because I consider myself self-educated. I, I read this material. I don't, I haven't been in school in 30 Jeez. Yeah, oh my it's God! Been it's been time. thirty-seven years. How long? Don't think about no, it. No, wait. That Don't can't even right. think about it. Thirty-two Just, years. Yeah. I graduated. Yeah, thirty-two, yeah. thirty-three years. It's ago. a shame. It's ah. sad. It's sad. Um, great conversation. Wow. Yes. Great conversation. Yes. I, and as we said, uh, once we stopped recording, we're going to try to get him on at the end of the year because he's got another book coming out. I think he said November, December. Yes. So you know, I I, I love talking about the classical period. Yes, it's, it's the best. Yeah. Um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. I love. I could just, I could talk about that all day. Well, you know, th those those guys were way ahead of their time. When you look at you know, I mean, look what happened in the medieval period mm -hmm. where everything just kind of yeah. went backwards, it seems, you know, and um, you didn't have great, I, I don't really know of too many great statesmen other than maybe some of the religious, yeah. um, um, Aquinas, or Thomas Aquinas, I think was his name. Aquinas. Aquinas. Um, Why would you say Aquinas? Okay, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have. I don't have. You someone... have never said Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas. 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 Whatever. I don't have anyone who tells me the phonetics. I just read it and I just move on. Okay. I've got. You know. There's Saint like... Augustine. Is that what you're going to say next? Yeah, Saint yep. Augustine of Hippo, which is weird. That's kind of a yeah. hippo. But yeah. Uh, but I, I don't know if. Too many great statesmen from, mm -hmm. you know, after Rome fell. Yeah, uh, and okay. Saint Augustine is technically he. Well, he at he, the he was very end of you know the sacking of Rome. So I guess you could almost say that it was. Yeah, he was somewhat still in by a vandal, I believe, when they mm -hmm. sacked uh, they sacked his home. I guess Hippo or wherever he's from, somewhere in Libya. I don't know, somewhere in Africa, hmm. North Africa, I think is where he was killed. But yeah, I think that was the vandals that did it. So anyway, but. But what I was going to say is, is that, you know, the, the Romans and the Athenians were just way ahead of their times uh, in, in philosophy. And, you know, our Western civilization. Construction. Look at those roads. Look at those aqueducts. Yes. What have and the Romans still, ever done for us? I know. Well, the aqueduct. <laughs> roads, well, you know, I mean. Education. Yeah. Security. Um, as, yes. Yeah. You remember, uh, you remember what Rome, sanitation, you remember what Rome, uh, Jerusalem used to smell like before, <laughs> before they got here. <laughs> And then, yes, uh, it was a the such crime. a great Remember scene. Remember what the city used to be like? Such a great <laughs> scene. <laughs> uh, and, oh, and the wine. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'd miss the wine. But, you know, no, the, um, but, you know, our Western civilization is uh, the foundation of Western civilization is, is uh, Rome, uh, Athens, Jerusalem, London. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think to some extent, even Paris. Yeah. Um, there was uh, in Spain. There was a school there that was really, really big. So, mm -hmm. would you put in Italy with Machiavelli? He had a major influence on things. Well, Machiavelli was was you know yeah he was a, he was in the Italian. Why did I yeah yeah Machiavelli yeah yeah he in fact he wrote his book I think to one of the the princes or one of the kings of uh, I mean you know I don't know there was but would I you put a, him in there like of of uh, Western civilization yeah absolutely and. Would you Erasmus? I'd put him in there for yeah. Western civilization, mm -hmm. and he came out around the time of uh, Martin Luther. Okay. So yeah, I would uh, Dante. Mm -hmm. I would put him in okay. there. So yeah. yeah, I mean, you've got so many influential people that yeah. that just wrote some you know fantastic works that that we. It still... really influenced us, yeah, majorly. Yeah, uh, uh, was that Algernon Sydney? Sydney? Algernon, mm -hmm. yeah, our friend in Arizona. Yep, with Joey. Joey Wolf, Joe Wolverton, yeah, he yeah. would. Uh, I consider Joe Wolverton a yeah. pinnacle, you know, pound, founder, I, yeah. I, pillar of uh, America. You, I think you'd make a very good statesman. Yeah. So yeah, yeah but yeah, Rome just not only just. And I think that's statesmen. part of the problem, and that's what Josiah was uh, also hinting at is you know politics is is definitely a problem because it's like oh it's you know it's us versus yeah. them right, 
statesmanship. Yeah. There's there. I, I'm like, I can't hardly even think of any statesman yeah. uh, that's in American politics right now. Uh, they're right all now? politicians. Yeah. Right now. Oh. Um, well, I mean, I, that, I, that, that I think Rand kind of... Paul is maybe relatively close because uh, in terms of what speaking that they come up speaking his his ideas um one he will go against his own party he's got no problem you know doing that um and uh, i guess mansion as well like he's got no problem going against his own party he's he, the statesman is one going to be a brilliant person but also is going to hold the the people in the highest regard not so much the party mm-hmm. um so yeah Anyways, all right. Well, that's 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 all. You want to get to uh, book and movie recommendations? Yes, yes. Let's do that. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I we only got the PDF version of How to Stop a Conspiracy by Josiah Osgood, uh, but very much recommended uh, to read that or. Uh, you gave me uh, a copy of of Salist, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a moment yeah. ago, I yeah, appreciate that. It had uh, it had um, the story of uh, Catiline and mm-hmm. uh, conspiracy, and it also the I I, I asked him the U- Ugarthine the Ugarthine war. It was a war in uh, Numidia, uh, in Africa, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, I I can't pronounce it. Yeah. And you know what? There was another question I was going to ask him whether there was a Tertius because I can't find him. Yeah. You, you saw Band of Brothers. Mm-hmm. Remember uh, when uh, that that the last uh, captain of uh, of Easy Company he said that Tertius um, he kept the rumor that he killed some people, some of his own men, to keep the rest of his men in line to fear him. When there was a story about were uh, they relating that to Pierce? Um, to what, Captain Pierce. Captain Pierce. That's not his name. The the last captain of. Um, I thought that was the guy who. The guy they who were re- rumoring had had shot all the, shot the Germans. All German. yeah. yeah, his name wasn't Pierce. I thought it was Pierce. Nah, it's something else. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Hmm. But uh, yeah, he said, uh, ter- you know, ter- Tertius uh, let the rumors about what he did continue so that they would know he was a badass. So. Okay. Well, go ahead and uh, pick your movie. Well, my okay. My movie is going to be uh, what I mentioned earlier when I when I talked about Henry the Second. It's going to be the Lion in Winter. Uh, now we're talking about the Lion in Winter that came out in 1968. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that story takes place uh, Christmas of 1183, when uh, he releases uh, Eleanor, his wife, from. He, he kind of put her in like a little prison in one of the, one of his castles, locked her up. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, she conspires with uh, her sons to overthrow Henry. Uh, Peter O'Toole plays Henry II. Catherine Hepburn plays Eleanor. You have uh, Anthony Hopkins, a young Anthony Hopkins. He plays Richard the Lionheart. Uh, Nigel Terry, you're, you're a fan of Excalibur. He played uh, King Arthur, Nigel Terry. Why would it, why am I a fan of you're, uh, you, Excalibur? You, you, you had Excalibur as one of your movies of the week. Did I? Yes, you did. No. Yes, you did. No, I've never even heard of Excalibur. I, you have that was you. No, you're, it wasn't. I think you were wrong. I think you're okay. wrong. All right, well, aren't you? And I'm trying to one. figure out if you're wrong on this Pierce thing. Spears. Spears. Dang it. Yes, Spears. We were both wrong. Spears, but I was close. Spears is the last name. All right, so you have. Uh, if you and like, what do you do with a spear? You pierce. Y- yes, you do. <laughs> but you're off the point here. You know, you miss, Go miss ahead. Go ahead. All right. So if you time. like King Arthur, uh, if you like the Excalibur, he played King Arthur. Nigel Terry did. Uh, he plays John Lackland. Uh, Timothy Dalton. He uh, took James over. Bond. Took over as James Bond after Roger for Moore two retired epis- for two movies. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, they short they short changed him. Yeah, I but think. you know they, he was uh, he was all right. That Lazenby guy was only did one. George Lazenby. George Lazenby only did one. Yeah, but uh, you have a Timothy Dalton who plays the French uh, Philip, who becomes Philip the Second, Philip Augustus, and and then I don't know who Jeffrey John Castle plays Jeffrey. Now Jeffrey didn't live long enough. I really want you to stop doing this. Like I know we've got one more episode. Yes. 
next season. Do not go through the entire IMDb cast list. I didn't. Don't do this. I didn't. Do I, not I, revert I, to your former behavior. Oh, my God. You know, there's a reason Don't why. Don't call on him. Okay. Oh, gods. <laughs> well, we're talking Roman about gods. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, Jupiter. Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my uh, movie uh, recommendation, because you freaking cut in on the very, while I'm doing my recommendation. I well, just because, realized that you cut in on what I was saying. Well, you know what? I haven't even done my book yet. Wow. I'm going, I haven't I'm, done my movie. I'm going to so do So you can do your book after I do my movie. You freaking clown. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my movie, I referenced it uh, at the end of our conversation with Josiah. There's a movie called Hostels, and uh, it's with Christian Bell, and it deals with um, Native Americans. Um, there's a, a chief that they are moving. Um, they're trying to he, – he, he was a bad guy, prisoner, um, the prisoner chief? of war more or less. And so he's got this – Christian Bell is I, – I forget his rank, but he's taking um, the Indian chief along with a few other Indians – back to, I guess, where their tribe is on the reservation, right? Well, um, one, Christian Bell does not like Indians. Um, they've already, they've had all the, the Indian wars and everything. Uh, but it really starts tying in like, okay, who are like, you would call the hostiles who are the savages, you know, because as the movie goes along, you're starting to pinpoint and like, dang, we can all be savages. We can all be hostiles and just gruesome and brutal, but it is a very good movie. And I really liked the way it ended because it sort of ended and with an ambiguous answer of, who was the greatest man to ever live? According to Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, was it Caesar was it Brutus? You know, and then it's like, okay, who are the bad guys, right? Who are the hostiles? Is it you? Is it you? You know, so it's actually a quite good movie. So it kind of reminds me of uh, The Walking Dead when uh, the when they uh, Ex- Alexandrians come across Negan mm-hmm. and his group. It's like, who are the bad guys? Yeah, because you know Rick's group they killed, they murdered like a big number of uh, Negan's group before they even met. So, yeah. well, except that one scene. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, Christian Bale, if you watch uh, the Shakespeare movie Henry V um, with Kenneth Branagh, the, the one that where he does the uh, uh, St. Crispin Day speech, mm-hmm. there is a very young Christian, Christian Bale, Bale in that movie. Yeah. So, um, so my, my book, obviously, is also going to be uh, uh, Josiah Osgood's book, um, you know, it, it's it's a in, very interesting subject. Um, you know, and 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 I did I um, I did read the passages and mm-hmm. um, didn't I didn't read the whole thing because I, I just got back a couple of days yeah. ago from yeah. uh, from my little trip. But uh, uh, you know, and honestly, it's, just, it's hard. Like I don't know how people do the the online like books. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I can't. I, I gotta, yeah, I gotta have the paper book. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of the same so. way. I, and I wish I wish I could read as fast as you because yeah. that's the one thing. Well, um, I wish I could read and, and retain like you, and you wish you could read as fast as me. But Oh, yeah, man, no if well. we could just combine our... If we could combine our efforts, we yes, could take over the planet or whatever. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, that brings our show Ooh, to an end. We can do a end. conspiracy, and it'd be like... Um, <clears throat> what would we do? We'd take over the galaxy as brother and brother. We can rule the galaxy. Brother in arms. Well, you know, the... Uh, Don't touch me. Luke and uh, Vader. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I couldn't. Where can people find us? Go ahead. Hurry well, up. they can find us on, on Facebook, like us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube. Very mm-hmm. important. Uh, we're going to be... Subscribe you know, to the newsletter. Hmm? Subscribe to the newsletter. Yes. Yes. You can get up to dates on, on what we're doing, what uh, what's coming up. Uh, we're we're going to be on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. And then we have our very own website, www.thesonsofhistory.com. Where we have articles, videos, and we have merchandise. Lots yep. of merchandise. Yep. Oh, Jupiter. All right. See you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good week. <laughs>